Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 3, Biological Diversity. This is video number 8 and we're going to be looking at natural selection in the context of Darwin's finches. The learning intention for this video is that you can investigate through secondary sources, observations and collections of data that were obtained by Charles Darwin to support the theory of evolution by natural selection, and specifically in the context of the finches of the Galapagos Islands. Now it's not possible for me to give you all of the data that uh, Darwin was collected on a video, but what we will do is first of all contextualise our look at Darwin's finches uh, by just reviewing natural selection and then to go into um, just some of the implications as a result of uh, Darwin's observations of the finches of the Galapagos. So the first thing we need to do is just to be very clear about natural selection. Remember, natural, uh, evolution wasn't Darwin's idea, um, but natural selection was the theory that Darwin put forward to explain evolution. So uh, remember that theories are explanations for observations that we make. So when we make our observations, natural selection is Darwin's theory for why those changes have come about. So his theory is basic is is Darwin's theory is based on these sort of premises so we can kind of work through these statements to get a bit of a, a context for our look at at finches so the first thing is that all organisms produce more offspring than can survive to adulthood each individual organism must face a series of trials of life just to survive and of course not all of them survive to adulthood or at least to reproductive age Sexual reproduction results in varying characteristics of individuals within a species. Now that is variation. Organisms which are best suited to an environment will be most likely to survive in that environment. And that's often been referred to as survival of the fittest. But of course, fitness means many different things. It doesn't just mean about winning a fight. Fitness is related to whatever the uh, selecting pressure is that is acting upon the population, and therefore fitness can mean very different things under very different selection pressures. And then surviving organisms will pass their genes onto their offspring, giving them the benefit of their adaptations. So we have to have some sort of reproduction, which is actually starting to change the gene pool. So the genes that have been uh, pre-selected as the ones that confer some advantage on the individuals are the ones that tend to um, increase in frequency in the population. Now, it's important that you don't express this in a way that makes it sound Lamarckian, which is that if I do something in my um, lifetime that um, you know builds up my own fitness that I can naturally pass that on to my offspring, because that's not the case. Uh, what will happen is that the population as a group um, may occasionally shift from time to time as certain characteristics are favoured because of certain environmental pressures. And so we see the um, frequency of those particular characteristics increasing in the populations. So another way of doing this is just to try and list these key points down so that gives us a nice little reference point. So I guess um, one of the things that I didn't talk about on the last slide was isolation. And isolation is, I guess, the difference between natural selection on a microevolutionary scale, which is within a species, and actual speciation. That is when a, when a particular population actually diverges and you get two uh, independent species. So that even when you bring those two groups, populations back together again, they will no longer uh, interbreed successfully. And isolation can occur for a number of different reasons. Firstly, it can occur on the basis of geography. So that might be something like uh, a river, a mountain or a stream, something that is separating two populations uh, in a physical geographical sense. Mechanical, there may be something about the mechanics that could be just to do with differences in sizes of different um, populations that allow, that means that the, the mechanics of reproduction maybe don't work uh, as well as they could. Um, temporal is about time. So maybe um, it's the fact that two different groups or two different populations may be mature uh, at different times in the year and therefore don't overlap sufficiently for them to be able to interbreed. 
Ecological is usually about habitats, something about where the organisms live. Maybe they just choose not to live in the same sort of areas. They, it's not that they can't cross boundaries. They can, but they choose not to. And of course, that um, if it comes down to simply about how organisms act, um, it could be behavioural. So that can also influence things um, uh, such as uh, mating rituals, or uh, mate selection, those sorts of things, where there's some sort of um, behavioural routine that particular um, males or females are looking for in order for them to um, select a mate. And if if you don't have the right dance, you don't get a um, you don't win a prize. So uh, so isolation is one of the important things that that um, helps to drive speciation as populations are separated from one another in one way or another. And then we have those three things that we just talked about. Variation. So there has to be variation within populations. So this is within a population. So variation is important and the variation needs to be within a population. Um, a selecting agent, um, some sort of selecting pressure, whether that is an abiotic or a biotic factor that is going to also impact on the particular um, organisms involved and reproduction. The fact that the, um, we have to do something with the gene pool. Some frequencies will change as uh, certain genes that express certain characteristics are favoured over others. So um, it's good to have a, a short list sometimes of the key things that you're looking for that are going to help you in your explanation. So let's see if we can apply these ideas to a study of Darwin's finches. So here's a nice little overview of the Galapagos finches. You can see a range of not only sizes, you get a bit of a sense of the size of the head of each of these birds that the actual bodies are going to be different sizes as well. So some of these birds are much larger than others. But of course, one of the things that's most important that we're looking at here is beaks. And beaks that are quite different and have been selected for on the basis of uh, food. So food availability and of course uh, type. And you can see a bit of an idea on this uh, graphic by looking at the fact that some of these uh, prefer seeds, some of them prefer fruits, some of them are insect eaters. Um, and each of these different types of food choices has had an impact on each of these different beaks. They're, they're each um, beautifully designed for the um, job that they do. And so if we're going to work through the stages of evolution, uh, via natural selection, then we need to be able to follow each of those steps in order to explain what happens here. So if we, if we, if we go through our steps, the first was ISO. So what, happens, what happened with isolation? Well, what we think might have happened is that a, um, a, a common ancestor, an ancestral group, um, reached the Galapagos Islands from the mainland, the local mainland, South America, and, um, and populated the islands. That created some sort of a, a separation point so that the, the birds that were on the islands were then separated from the mainland birds. And so whilst they were originally part of the same population, now they've been isolated. The fact that there was some variation in the way that the um, beaks were formed meant that some of these birds had uh, beaks that were better suited for cracking seeds, others better suited for um, picking off little tiny insects and things like that. And as um, and in each of these different environments where these different food types were more common, so that created a selection pressure. which acted on that variation. So that birds that had a beak that was better suited to a particular food type uh, survived and thrived, and of course were then able to pass that advantage on to their offspring. So over time, the um, population shifted so that there was um, 
potentially less variation in the types of beaks uh, and more consistency in the in the beak that went with the type of food that was the most abundant in the areas or on the islands where these these birds were found. Now the interesting thing about Galapagos finches is obviously um, being one of Darwin's uh, great um, areas of evidence. A lot of people have subsequently studied the finches of the Galapagos and they've, they've noticed some patterns in um, changes in frequency in what we call microevolution, which broadly speaking um, just describes changes within the species level, so not beyond the species level, but shifts in population numbers where you can actually see changes in the beaks as a consequence of either particular types of food becoming more or less abundant. So even within populations, you can actually see some shifting uh, in the numbers or the frequencies of different types of um, beaks as the food becomes more or less abundant or scarce. So Darwin gathered a lot of information uh, while he was on the Beagle. He was away for five years and, and certainly brought back thousands of specimens um, that enabled him to look at a huge range of different organisms. And one of those organisms that he studied, um, amongst many others, was the finches of the Galapagos Islands. And he noticed that variation that went very specifically with food availability. And this is where our understanding of evolution via natural selection can come into practice as we walk through each of these steps to identify how, uh, from a single ancestral population, this diversity um, of birds may have developed. Thanks for watching.